Enlisted or enlisted? I was drafted, and the uh, main reason I was drafted is I had two older brothers who were in the service, and uh, they had joined, and they told me um, less is better, uh, wait and be drafted and spend two years in the Army. And um, after that, did you go to boot camp or whatever it was yes. called at the time? Um, was shipped from New Haven to Fort Dix, New Jersey spent my uh, basic training at, in New Jersey and uh, left New Jersey and uh, headed for Washington State. Do you remember the date you joined the service or roughly? Yes, it was uh, September, roughly September 1st and that was 1965. Okay. And, uh, can you tell me a little bit about your experiences uh, in boot camp? I, I certainly can. Um, I learned to eat a lot of food that I never ate before. Um, they work you so hard and so long that you eat anything they'll put in front of you. Um, I remember that most of all. Um, other than, than that, um, just uh, getting shaved, getting your head shaved, and being yelled at all the time. And, uh, <laughs> Another piece of information my brothers told me was never to be first and never to be last. Always be somewhere in the middle. <laughs> how did, did you, uh, and again, how old were you when you joined? I, I was uh, 19 when I Okay, so as a young man, it was the first experience. Yes. Yeah. Anything like first, that. First experience of being away from home. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you remember any of your instructors in boot camp? None whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and how did you cope getting through all of that early on as a young man? Um, I, I think they uh, kept you so busy you didn't ha have any time to really think about anything other than, than what you were doing and, and staying uh, uh, safe. And after boot camp, where did you head off to after okay, that? I headed, uh, that was a story in itself because um, I was in New Jersey and got orders to go to Fort Lewis, Washington. And the Army had us believing that we were going to a very cold, uh, frigid area. And uh, Fort Lewis is in the Seattle-Tacoma area on the coast. And the climate is quite a bit milder there than it is here on the east coast in the winter. And uh, they had us dressed in um, heavy overcoats and scarves and mittens and heavy boots and we got off the plane and it was warmer there than it was in New Jersey. And that, that always left a vivid memory for me. What was your assignment when you were in Tacoma? Well, when uh, I got reassigned to um, advanced infantry training at uh, Fort Lewis and it was with the 4th Infantry Division and uh, and then that was an eight-week uh, stint, and after that, um, I was a assigned to A Company, 2nd Battalion, 8th Infantry, and we were training. Uh, they didn't tell us, but we were training to go to Vietnam. Is that something you expected, even though they didn't tell you? Yes, we all expected it, yeah. and that's why the draft was so um, uh, prevalent back then. They took anybody who could walk or talk. What were your thoughts about that as you were being assigned to an infantry unit? You know, I, I thought that, uh, I, at the time, I thought I was um, doing what my country wanted me to do and I was being, uh, you know, a patriotic uh, individual and, and serving. Uh, do you recall when you left there and where you went next after yeah, that assignment? Um, I was there for almost uh, um, the remainder of the year and shipped out to... Um, Vietnam by troop carrier. It was a ship, uh, General John Pope, and it was a merchant marine ship. And, uh, and we were just uh, numbers and we slept on uh, uh, bunks that were, I, I always remembered it being about nine people high, and uh, my friends say on a, it wasn't any more than five high, but uh, I remember being vi in very tight confines on this troop carrier going over to Vietnam. Um, we, uh, we kept on being told that uh, you're fortunate because any time you spend on the ship is time in country. 
so you could get to go home sooner. And, and uh, we ran into a uh, typhoon along the way out in the, in the ocean, and, uh, and we had to circle for three days before the typhoon passed, and everybody got seasick, and uh, including me. That was an experience in itself, but it was another three days I wasn't in Vietnam. I didn't know at the time how fortunate I was, but uh, now I do. <laughs> had you ever been to sea before? I had never been, to, been on a ship before, no. Another new experience. It was uh, definitely a new experience. And, uh, do you recall um, when you arrived in Vietnam on that ship and yes. where it was? Yeah, we, we arrived in Quinan, and of course it was a, uh, a military uh, troop carrier, and, and they had uh, landing craft, typical of what, what we had remembered seeing in Normandy on the invasion where um, the landing craft, the troops would get on the landing craft and go to shore. Well, we went down the rope ladders, uh, typical of what you see the, uh, you know, in documentaries. We got on the landing craft and we had all our gear, all our combat gear, including our M16 rifles, uh, but no ammunition. And we all envisioned the front ramp of this um, troop carrier, the LST, coming to shore and we had no ammunition. And as the ramp came down um, on the sandy uh, beaches there at Queen Anne, um, we looked up and there were school buses to pick us up and take us to our next uh, transfer site. And it was a, a shock for all of us, but a relief too, for sure. Do you remember the day that you arrived there? What I, the date I was? don't remember no. the date that I arrived there. And can you describe a little bit about your first day in country there? Yeah, we, we uh, went as an infantry division. The whole 4th Division moved out of Fort Lewis, Washington together. And when we got there, we got in these school buses. Of course, they were uh, OD in color. They weren't yellow like a typical school bus. And, uh, and they took us to another staging area where we got on um, two and a half ton uh, trucks, army trucks that have the canvas roofs and seats for the, the troops. We got on that and then we drove what seemed like hours to this open field in the middle of nowhere. And that's where they told us, well, this is where you're setting up camp. Uh, get your pup tents out and start filling sandbags, and um, this is going to be your home for a while. So that was there was no base there when you there arrived? There was nothing there whatsoever. Did you uh, remain there for a while? We, we stayed there until um, the, the perimeter was secure and they had uh, a permanent... Uh, um, tents and, and things that, and that was going to be the, the what was known as Camp Anari or the 4th Infantry Division's headquarters. We didn't know it at the time, but that's what it was. But it wasn't, oh, maybe two weeks or so, and we get uh, flown out on our first uh, combat mission, and uh, UE helicopters picked us up, and, and of course, we're, we're going out into the field now, and with nothing but our backpacks and uh, maybe three days rations on our back and uh, and our first combat assault was uh, was quite uh, quite an experience the helicopters flew us into to an, an open grassy area and they said okay jump well unbeknownst to us we were jumping into elephant grass and although we might have been two feet off of the top of the grass it was another 10 feet till we hit the ground. And more people were injured in that first combat assault um, than by, by the helicopter jumps than, than uh, by enemy contact. Hmm. And it was quite an experience for sure. What, what section of Vietnam are you, are you basically in then? Uh... We, we were in Kantum province, which is the central highlands. It's, it's almost the middle of the country, and uh, and we were in a mountainous area. Uh, mountains were oh, somewhere around 1,500 to 3,000 feet tall in that area, and uh, and we did a lot of humping up and down hills, and most of the areas that that uh, 
were named by numbers, not by names. They didn't even have names of the mountains. So. Do, do you remember your first contact, uh, if you had any? I assume you saw a combat if you oh, were in yes. that area. Yeah. Um, I, I can remember uh, one of our platoons going out on one of the first missions and, uh, and running into uh, the Viet Cong. And we dealt not only with the, the Viet Cong, but the regular Vietnamese army. Um, and, uh, and we even saw some Chinese um, that were assisting the North Vietnamese troops. So, was, was that how many days into your, uh, your, when you were dropped off by the helicopters? Was that on the same day? It was on the same contact? day. Yeah, the first day that, um, they started doing patrols, and we didn't run into large numbers. It was uh, sporadic, small, uh, small numbers of the uh, North Vietnamese, and we think they were on recon missions, and w you know, we don't know what happens uh, after that. But I, was, uh, I was fortunate in one regard. Um, I wasn't in one of the platoons. I was the uh, um, executive officer's radio operator. So all of my uh, um, work was done with him. I took care of uh, resupply of uh, uh, food, clothing, um, medical needs, uh, and, and I did the, uh, the communications with the helicopters when they came in for resupply. I would, uh, and everything was coded, and we would tell them what color uh, smoke we were throwing so they'd know they were going in the right area. And uh, So being on the radio, at least I wasn't out there as a point man and, and, um, and, and having to come face to face with the enemy on a, you know, just by a chance. Now, another thing that wasn't so good is I had a long, high antenna that was a target for them, and they always looked for the antennas, the snipers, and the, and the enemy. So. Do you recall your, um, your, your platoon leaders or your company commander's uh, name by any chance? Yeah, I do. Um, Captain Sprout was the, uh, the company commander, and the uh, first lieutenant that I worked for was uh, Lieutenant Arnold, and uh, and I'm still in contact with Lieutenant Arnold, and I visit him down in Virginia occasionally. So that was a fun experience. Another job of mine was that I was the mail clerk, so anytime um, we got mail in the field, uh, I would distribute it to the whole company. That was a rewarding uh, time for the men to to get letters from home and packages. Was that your primary way of staying in contact with family back home? That was it, yourself and others. There was no other uh, contact, except if you were at base camp every once in a while, um, there was a uh, ham radio operator, and they would uh, could patch you through via um, some electronic method, and but most of the time was mail. Were you ever able yeah. to use the radio to try to communicate home? or? No, no, no. O only if you you were at base camp and you went to this the place that the ham radios operated, and then you could talk. And I don't think I only did it once my whole time in country, which was about a year's time. How how frequently did you receive communication from home or the other way around? Were you sending letters home as well? Yeah, I, guess, no? um, I, I, my mom, believe it or not, tried to send me a package every day. But it, I never got them every day, and sometimes never got them at all, uh, because of where we were or uh, the, the mail service was not that great. How did the mail get to you out in the field? Um, it would be dropped from helicopters. Mm -hmm. And if we were lucky enough to be at a landing zone, an LZ, um, they could land and, and bring us hot meals, and, uh, and then they wouldn't have to drop the mail sacks. And, and get damaged. So. Were there any radios you could listen to, like you'd have here, AM radios, FM radios? No, none whatsoever. So your only method of communication our, was our, our only uh, communications with what was happening back home was that, and the USO had a newspaper. I don't remember the name of it now, but we would get a, a newspaper. But I'm sure that was slighted by the government, and we we didn't hear everything that was going on. 
but were you ever able to experience the USO show like the Bob Hope shows? Yes, or anything like that? I, I, I did. It was a lottery system, and uh, and I was lucky enough to get chosen to go to the Bob Hope show. And I was out in the field. I was at a fire support base, which we frequently guarded, and uh, and got picked up by a Chinook helicopter, and uh, and taken to uh, the base camp in play. Play cool at the Campanari, and I got to see Bob Hope, and that that was a special uh, uh, time. Uh, Martha Ray, and uh, and of course he brings an entourage of many of the uh, young girls, and that was, it was nice to to see that. That was a fun time. And that was just one evening, just away from oh the yeah, combat. just one one evening out of the field, and then right back. Yeah. You were mentioning uh, food on occasion being hot rations, but what did you typically survive Ty typically on? Typically, we, we ate um, sea rations, which were uh, can all canned foods, and uh, and they had all different kinds of meals: spiced beef and lima beans and ham, and uh, they even had bread that was canned, and it was all World War II vintage. It was all uh, from 1945 uh, time. And I guess they were using it all up. After we left, that I think the meals got better. They came out with different types of rations and, and food. But, uh, we survived. You know, the, it was certainly nutritious. Did you eat anything uh, from the local environment or not? I did. I did. I did when I went to Japan, um, which I got a chance to go to Japan for R and R, uh, and I was able to. Uh, to, to eat a lot of Japanese food, which was nice. How, how many months were you in country before you were able to get a trip I, out of country? I was there that? about six months before I got to go go out, and you only got to go out for one week. But uh, it was a treat because we're out in the field, and then you, you have to get uh, a helicopter ride to uh, a forward base camp where you could get on a, um, a truck or a jeep. And then they take you to base camp, and then you get to go up to the Air Force uh, base, and then they fly you to. Uh, um, I went to Cameron Bay, which was uh, an Air Force base, and it was just gorgeous. It was like being, uh, you know, uh, on vacation someplace. The Air Force had it made compared to the Army for sure. And then we flew from there to Japan, and it was on a. Uh, a, a regular, it was a United Airlines flight, a regular uh, U.S. A civilian plane. And to see um, stewardesses with nice round eyes, that was, <laughs> it was a treat. That was uh, certainly something that was different. I'm sure the return trip wasn't quite as exciting. No, it wasn't nearly as exciting. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> you knew you were going back to the yeah. same unit, the same place. Yeah. 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 And in Japan, uh, the, the Japanese thought very highly of the Americans, and everywhere I went, um, especially the young kids, would want my autograph, which I thought was uh, odd, but uh, I certainly complied. It was it was neat. Yeah. Went to Yokohama and Tokyo, and, and had a good time there. And and you, when you flew back to Vietnam, then uh, to your unit, how many months did you have left? And then I. In country. I had another six months. I spent just shy of a year in Vietnam. Um, from from what I recall, um, about half the time it was monsoon season and raining, and uh, the other half of the time was uh, hot and dusty and uh, very sunny all the time. But being in the mountains, at least at night, we got some relief because it cooled off at night. So. We had to cross rivers. Um, sometimes we had to. Somebody would swim across with a rope, so everybody else could hold onto the rope and uh, and pull themselves across the rivers. And um, there there weren't a lot of roads where we were, and a lot of our trails were all cut um, with machetes and and by hand. Um, one time I can remember uh, crossing the border into Cambodia. And, uh, and being on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Um, we weren't supposed to be there, we weren't supposed to talk about it. 
but uh, was that I, by plan or by accident? Oh no, it was by plan. Yeah, we were sent there, and they wanted to see how much uh, traffic was coming from the north to the south via the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and uh, we saw places where they were using elephants to transport <clears throat> supplies, and the elephants, uh, as they walked next to trees, would <clears throat> take the uh, bark right off the sides of the trees, high, about 10 feet up in the air. And it, it was, uh, every, everybody looked at it in the beginning and wondered, what the heck is that? And, it, and that's what it turned out to be. Um, went into a lot of uh, villages of the uh, indigenous people, they called them mountain arts. And uh, in some cases, we had to move an entire village because there was going to be a B-52 bomb strike in the area because of heavy uh, North Vietnamese troops. And uh, I can remember one time we had to even move oxen, and that was a, a trip. Um, I had never had anything to do with large animals like that before, and that, that was uh, how did an you experience. How did you accomplish Well, it was all, all by uh, uh, leading them. And couple of guys behind it and a couple of guys pulling, getting them up onto the, uh, the deuce and a half trucks to, to ship them out. And it was an experience. It's probably a better way of doing it, but um, we couldn't uh, converse with the mountain arts. The, the language was different than the Vietnamese language. And uh, I've got some neat pictures and, and hopefully they'll tell some of the story about uh, you know what I saw there. Were the uh, indigenous uh, mountain yards were they um, upset having to leave? Oh yeah, they didn't want to leave. Um, and any time we went into one of these villages, um, we only saw old men, women, and young kids. And the young men and women, we figure, were out working for the North Vietnamese. I, and I think we don't know, but we suspected that. So. When you were um, can you describe a, a time when you might have seen in direct combat or one mission that sticks in your mind in yeah, particular? Yeah, well, one that sticks in my mind, and uh, unfortunately we had a lot of casualties. One of our um, companies, it was C Company, was, uh, was on a hill, and uh, at night it was getting overrun by uh, North Vietnamese troops. And A Company, which I was in, was assigned to go give them help. And it was in the middle of the night. We couldn't see where we were going. We could hear all of the shooting and the, the mortars and, and all that's going on. We couldn't see hardly anything where we were walking. And when we got there, uh, uh, most of C Company had been killed. But the, the captain was still alive and, and, and some of the other guys, and we did keep them from getting overrun. And, we, and that was the deadliest, I think, that I saw and, and the most disturbing. And I remember that vividly. They, they were, um, did, were you able to evacuate the wounded from that? Oh, or? yeah. We, 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 um, the... Uh, North Vietnamese retreated, and we were able to, the next morning, uh, blast an LZ and get the medevac in and, uh, and, and get the wounded out. So. And then you were, you had to go back to wherever you were working we prior back. to that? Yeah, we, we were, um, at the time, uh, watching a fire support base, and, uh, and after that we went back with the rest of the C Company, and uh, and continued on uh, our assignments there. But it, almost every day, platoons would go off and uh, on little missions just to see what where the activity was, what was going on. Um, one time, we even uh, uh, ran into I think it was about eight North Vietnamese, and they had maps, detailed maps of the fire support base that we were. Um, watching and they figured that they were taking that information back to their battalion and we're going to uh, try to um, take us over so 
Did, did you capture prisoners of war? Oh yeah, case? we we had prisoners of war, and uh, um, mo most of the luckily most of them uh, um, weren't alive. So, but we did have some, and we did have an interpreter that was with us, and we did have some uh, some of the uh, South Vietnamese army on occasion would be with us, and, and whenever they we would catch somebody, uh, they could talk with them, try to get information out of them, and, and that was interesting too. Do you uh, recall any other missions you'd like to talk about? Other than the, the daily uh, uh, patrols and uh, the sniper fire and, uh, and, and the... Uh, no, I had really nothing more about missions, but uh, about halfway through um, our campaign there, um, we went mechanized. And once we got uh, personnel carriers, it was much easier for us to get around, cover a lot of ground, and it was much safer. And we had a much better uh, kill ratio when we went mechanized. It was much easier to overcome the enemy with the mobility. Can you describe yeah. one of these uh, PC, vehicles? Yeah, a personnel carrier had tracks like a bulldozer would have, except they were, uh, and they had a trap door in the back for getting in and getting out of and they, uh, they had an armor plate all around them, so it, it took a lot to stop one. Uh, um, certainly a landmine would stop it, but uh, uh, small arms fire didn't, and most of what the North Vietnamese had, no, they had some rockets and, and landmines, but for the most part, we w could overpower them with the uh, the vehicles. And you had a number of those? Oh yeah. Assigned? The whole company was outfitted with them. Nobody had to walk. Everybody rode after that. So that and was a better time, do you feel? That was a better time. It was yeah. definitely safer. Yeah. And we were much more effective. We thought we were doing better in, in the PCs, for sure. Did you ride inside the vehicle? Yeah, we did. It wasn't that yeah. super hot then? or? Um, yeah, but it was better being hot than to be walking with all the packs and all the equipment. If you didn't have, you know, especially me carrying a radio on top of everything else, it, it was easier to, to be in the PC. And they had ventilation systems, but no air conditioning, but they had ventilation. And, uh, and they had a big uh, 50 caliber gun mounted on the top, which was a uh, nice firepower too. Mm -hmm. so. And those could maneuver through the jungle oh, yeah. you were describing yeah. before. A, a lot of the, uh, you know, they'd go right through bamboo and they'd go up and down the hills like uh, nobody's business. They were like uh, a bulldozer. Hmm. Uh, they'd go across the streams and they'd even float. And, you, and if you got into a river that was deeper, you could still drive across them. So no more swimming and no more, you know. And if it rained, you had a, a shelter with you. So that was a nice... Uh, Nice feature. Can you recall how you might have passed time? I mean, not every day was probably filled with activity, but can you recall how did you cope with every day? Well, um, well, <laughs> one thing that's kind of funny is that uh, I did get packages from home, and my brother used to uh, take a loaf of Italian bread, and uh, and he used to take the uh, the meat part out of the bread and used to put a bottle of brandy in there. And then he'd wrap it up with tin foil and then package it nice and tightly and send me that package. So that helped me cope many a night, uh, a nice bottle of brandy. <laughs> and, uh, and I used to bunk with, uh, in, in a little pup tent with a, uh, one of the medics. And, uh, and he and I, um, sometimes would uh, get a little too jovial and we'd be told to, you know, shut up. But, yeah. but that was a way of coping, certainly. But uh, other than that, uh, being the executive officer's uh, radio operator, once a month um, I'd get the opportunity to leave the field either by wheeled vehicle or by helicopter and go back to the base camp and get payroll. And of course, I'd, I'd be the armed guard for the uh, 
executive officer, so I'd have to go with him. So at least once a, a month, I'd get to go back to base camp, spend a night, take a nice hot shower, and uh, and get clean clothes, and 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 then go back to the field. So that, that was one good part about being the radio operator. How did you receive yeah. pay when you were in country? Was it in cash or? You had a choice. Obviously, wasn't a check. You, you, I don't you, imagine. You had a choice. You could either have it sent home by check or deposited in, in your account or cash. And most of the GIs, believe it or not, took cash. And um, and that's how they would pass. Can you recall what and, you would spend the cash on if you were in the field? or? Well, I, I think a, a month's pay was about $125, so <laughs> we didn't spend a lot of money. <laughs> and I think most people sent it home. Mm -hmm. you know, they sent the cash home. Yep. So that was another thing. Mail was free. We didn't have to pay for any of our mail. Um, I think we had to put our uh, PO box or something on the thing, and and it w it would go free. So guys sent a lot of mail home, which was nice. And photographs. I mean, it wasn't. I, there weren't video a, cameras then, but I had a camera. Most people didn't, but. I carried a camera and I took lots of pictures. I came home with about 300 slides. And of course, some of them are good, some of them are not so good. But uh, I've got some some nice pictures of, of helicopters and uh, airplanes and uh, some bombing and some uh, some blasting when we were cutting LZs. And uh, I've got some. Some, some nice pictures for memories, for sure. We're talking about blasting for. Um, how would you? Yeah, we, how would you? How would you make uh, the, a place for the helicopters the, to land? The engineers would. Uh, well, when we were in the field and had to had to get evacuated, our everybody carried Composition Four, which is um, plastic explosives, and we would use that, to put around the base of a tree, and actually blow the tree up. And it, and it just level the, that area, and uh, and that's not only did we blow up trees and make landing zones with it, um, we used it to heat our sea rations. If you took a little piece of it and lit it, um, it would burn very hot. So in a very short time, your can of uh, spiced beef or whatever would uh, would be nice and hot. So, and at, at night, every night when we were walking, you'd have to dig a foxhole and and uh, and you'd have to put out uh, claymore mines to pr protect and protect the uh, perimeter and uh, and you'd have listing listening posts, which are just guys that are way out and they're just listening for any noises that happen. And they're kind of the first line of defense. When they hear something, they call back. Um, via radio and alert everybody else that you know that you have incoming. And they're supposed to run back, obviously, before the, the enemy comes in. Well, the first time it happened, of course, we were all jittery, didn't know what the heck was going on, and they hear um, a lot of noise in the bushes. And it sounded like a group of people were you know, coming through the, the woods and the bushes. And, uh, and of course, we hear them shooting and uh, and they're running and they're and by the time they get back they're screaming and uh, and out from the woods comes the uh, water buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> that was the first experience. Of course, it's pitch black. You you can hardly see anything. It didn't have the nice night vision stuff you have today, and uh, and that that was pretty scary. But it <laughs> kind of. Uh, 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 broke the ice and, uh, and and settled us down into you know what was really going to happen. <laughs> How were you able to identify someone coming back? Your your listening post person well, it's, versus the enemy. Well, it was strictly strictly by radio um, communications and getting the word out to all of the uh, the perimeter that you had friendlies coming in, and uh, well, without the radios, you'd be out of luck for sure. You couldn't see it. it was very dark at that time. You couldn't see, sun. very dark. You'd see just uh, figures, uh, silhouettes in the, in the dark. And if you did have an enemy contact, they generally uh, uh, popped these uh, flares. 
and it would light up the sky and then it'd be like daylight and you could see what you were doing. But initially um, it was dark and, and you couldn't see anything. Were these techniques that you used in Vietnam something you learned back in boot camp in advanced infantry or were we they did. things that you actually no, created? We, yeah, they taught us uh, all of that back at, at, uh, in advanced infantry training. And, you know, they prepared us for jungle warfare when we were there. And of course, they didn't tell us that's what we were going to do, but everybody knew. Uh, everybody at that time was going to Vietnam. Um, uh, did you feel that you were prepared correctly when you arrived there? Uh, no, I didn't. didn't think we had nearly enough training for what we were up, up against. Mm -hmm. But uh, you learn fast. Um, I had a, a grandmother who lived to 107, and and she was around 102, I think, when I went over, and she gave me um, some words of wisdom, and she told me to uh, keep my head down, but keep my chin up, meaning keep your spirits up, but don't make yourself a big target. Did you find you were and, able to keep your spirits up? Oh yeah, I, in the country. I, I always had a very good outlook on life, and uh, and I always tried to to make a joke out of whatever ha happened because you had to make the best of what you were up against. And uh, can you describe some of the friendships you may have had through that um, camaraderie of combat when you were in country? Yeah, uh, it's kind of funny because uh, most of the uh, uh, the friends you make there. Um, you don't, it's not the same as friends you made in school or, uh, or after. Um, you always had in the back of your mind that this friend might not be going home with you. And I don't think the friendships were long lasting. They were very strong and viable while you were there because um, you, you relied on every, everybody to take care of you as well as you take care of everybody else. But uh, you always had in the back of your mind, at least I did, I don't know if everybody had that same feeling, but uh, boy, that friend might not be there. And unfortunately, uh, a lot of them didn't come home. Uh, I came home without a scratch, which was uh, a miracle, I think. Um, I can, you know, you, you asked earlier about, uh, you know, missions and things that happen, and, and one just comes to, to mind. Uh, we were being, uh, we had a sniper attack and in several, uh, um, several snipers were keeping our company down and we couldn't advance and uh, we called in artillery to, uh, to assist us and, and maybe hit the uh, snipers and the artillery came in on us instead of on the enemy. And uh, and one uh, one of the, the the one of the guys that was uh, shot by a sniper, we were carrying. There were four of us carrying a stretcher. He was a big guy and heavy, and uh, so four of us were carrying the stretcher. And uh, one of our artillery came in and landed right next to the four of us. And two of my friends on either on diagonal ends of the stretcher were hit by shrapnel. Me and the other fellow, we didn't get a scratch. We both lost our hearing temporarily. I totally couldn't. I couldn't talk on the radio anymore. I couldn't. You know, I couldn't talk with anybody because I couldn't hear anything. Uh, but that that was uh, one of those situations where you say, "Boy, you know, it just wasn't my time. I just was lucky," and it was luck. So. Do you know if the other two survived? The other, the other two survived. They were just shrapnel wounds, uh, but they were medevaced out also once the uh, snipers were uh, were killed or ran away. I don't even remember. I think we ended up getting uh, four um, North Vietnamese troops at that point we had killed, and uh, and then we were able to get medevac uh, helicopters in and and get our wounded out. So. Were the um, in situations like that when someone left on a medevac, uh, 
I would assume they might not have come back to the unit. Depending Usually on how never saw them again. So you yeah. were having new individuals come to replace yeah. them? Yeah. Uh, so the unit was changing on a fairly well, regular changed, basis? Uh, yeah, it changed on a daily basis. After, after about oh, three months, I would say, um, a lot of people got uh, injured from uh, not, not only, well, the, right off the bat, I mentioned the uh, helicopter assault and, and people getting broken arms and legs and from the jump, but um, punji stakes um, were deployed everywhere and you're walking along a trail and guys would get a punji stake in the leg and they'd be back and we wouldn't see them again. Can you describe what that is? A uh, punji stake was a piece of bamboo sharpened very, very sharp. And there was always the threat that there was human feces or waste on the punji stake. And if it was, it could be very deadly. So when it, it was just a matter of fact that if somebody was uh, wounded with a punji stake, they would uh, be evacuated and, and be treated as if it were um, treated with their, if it had uh, feces on it. Never saw a lot of the uh, the booby traps and things that uh, we did see some, but not to the extent of when I got home and did more reading about what was going on in Vietnam and saw the news more and saw what was happening. We never saw the the pits that had uh, punji stakes in them where you could be walking along and go in a hole and. Um, I was there early in the campaign. It was, uh, you know, 66, 67, and after that, I think the uh, Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese got a little bit. Uh, they knew more what was going on and uh, and how they could wound more servicemen. So, and so I was fortunate in that regards too. I was early in that campaign. I never saw the Tet Offensive and. Never had, um, our company really never had large um, people wounded and, and killed. It's, you know, a little here and there, but I, I was fortunate, I think. As you got closer to the time when you were ready to leave, um, did the feelings change? Were you, were you sensing you were close to getting out? Oh, and... there's, there's no question about it. I was lucky in that regards too, but. Uh, um, everybody carried what they called the short timer stick, and it had notches on it, and you'd notch um, the the days that that you had to uh, to leave the country. But uh, I was back at base camp. Uh, matter of fact, I was there with the lieutenant and and doing uh, my job, the mail, and uh, and getting pay. And I was good friends with the company clerk. And the company clerk came up to me and says, "Hey, you want to go home today?" And I says, "But I got 14 more days." Like, yeah. He says, "Well, somebody um, was killed, and there's a seat vacant on the plane." And he says, "I can change the paperwork, get your name in there, and get you out of here." And uh, and all I had to do was get two officers to sign, and uh, and that was not difficult. Um, I had been working for the officers and, and they were happy to see that I could leave and they signed my papers and I got on a plane and left. So, but was, were there any mixed emotions with that? It was kind of sudden? Uh, uh, no mixed emotions whatsoever. I, you know, at that point, um, after being uh, wet and cold and, uh, and hot and, and dry, um, I was ready to leave. I, and, and coming home, um, did you they, fly? Did, where did you fly we, off? We of? flew a, a military uh, plane. I think it was a C-141 transport. We flew to uh, Clark in the Philippines, and then they flew us to um, Oakland, California. I believe. I don't know if I went into uh, San Francisco or Oakland, but I think it was Oakland. I know I mustered out of Oakland, and then. Uh, Do you recall they, that homecoming when you yeah, first they, arrived back yeah, in the states? They, what did it feel like? And they. Uh, they told us it'd be a good idea to get out of your military uniform as soon as possible. Uh, that there were a lot of protesters against the war, and if you were in military uniform, you might be uh, 
uh, targeted. And uh, how did you feel about that? And and I, I couldn't believe it. Um, it was a, a rude awakening. I had no idea of the uh, dissension here in the United States or here at home uh, about the war. Uh, and uh, and it it definitely uh, um, it, it was there were mixed emotions. I just couldn't believe uh, what was going on. But um, later on, I learned more and more the reasons why, and you can kind of understand. But um, still, when we came home, we thought we were going to be treated like uh, like the end of World War Two, and uh, with fanfare and uh, bands, and and that never happened. Uh, we saw the protesters, and we. Um, we were even spit upon uh, coming off, but it didn't take us long to get our uniforms off and become civilians again. Did you have to travel home from the West Coast? Then? I did. I flew out of San Francisco back to Connecticut. Back in Connecticut, it wasn't nearly as bad as San Francisco. And I think the first thing I, I, wa I wanted when I came back was a nice ice cream cone. Um, it's one thing I didn't get much of when I was there in Vietnam, and uh, and it's just driving in the driveway and seeing the trees and the flowers and the, you know, just just being home was a, a big relief. Uh, I certainly wouldn't wish war <clears throat> on anybody. Yeah. Was your family there to greet you? I assume. Oh when yeah, you got home. they met me at the airport and and drove me home. Of course, they took me to an ice cream shop first. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> if you reflect on it now, from uh, at the age you are now, do you think that the experience of being in Vietnam for that year uh, changed your way of thinking or the way you feel about things? No, I don't. I don't think it changed the person who I am. I, th I think I'm the same person. Um, going in as coming out of the Army. Um, it certainly uh, made me uh, oh, respect all the servicemen, the people that are serving this country. And I've been an advocate for veterans sin since then. And certainly won't let happen to the people who are fighting for us now in Afghanistan and, and overseas that uh, happened to the Vietnam vets when we came home. But I don't think I'm a different person because of it. Um, my family background and, uh, and support, I think, were beneficial in, in, in molding me. Well, can you think of anything else you'd like to uh, add to the uh, recording before we stop? Or? No, nope, I, uh, I think I pretty much said enough. Okay, well then in closing, if I could uh, thank you for your service from a personal level. You're welcome. Okay. And thank you. And welcome home. <laughs>